Greetings and welcome to the next episode of the Hourlings Podcast Project. My name is Martin Wilsey and I'm your host. Tonight, it's Ask the Authors Anything. Um, we put up a post during the week on uh, social media last week and we got a bunch of questions that we are going to pick some of them and uh, go around the room and answer them from our own perspectives. Um, I guess I'll start. Um, we got all the questions listed here. A question that I, the most common question I got was, um, how much does it cost to publish a book? Mm -hmm. um, I, I got that in several different um, places. Um, it depends on what your goals are here. I mean, yep. it's to um, uh, actually uh, publish a book and print and Kindle and um, hardcover if you wanted to. Technically, it c doesn't cost you anything. The actual publishing part of yep. it is, is free. Um, yep. The thing oh, is, right. though, with the caveat I'd put on that, if you want to... Um, um, if you want to do a book that's actually professionally packaged, there is some things that are going to cost you money. Um, first and foremost um, is a professional editor. You have to have your books professionally edited. Um, we have done total episodes on, uh, on that. It is so important. Mm -hmm. um, you, you could have the best story in the world if it's... If it's not well edited, nobody's going to buy it and people will hate it. Um, that's number one. Uh, number two, you've got to have a really good cover. You know, you got to actually, for your genre, you have to have a, um, a, a good cover that is unique and is professional and usually it costs money. So that's another uh, cost item. Um, there's, there's two costs with that too because there, there can be the cost of the cover image and there can be the cost of a designer to actually design the, the, the yep. tech. Right. So at a bare minimum, those are the things that you're going to need. And if, uh, you know, if you do it right, it's going to cost you a couple thousand dollars to actually um, get the, a really uh, good professionally packaged uh, book to print. I now, the thing I'm is, gonna... I always look at that. I always consider that an investment. Mm -hmm. not an expense pay it so opinions from you guys absolutely 100 percent. i think if you want to actually sell books and make money off of them the only way you can accomplish that is by having a product out there that is comparable to that that produced by traditional publishers mm -hmm. so if your book has a terrible cover it's not going to sell yeah. if it's a cover that's not genre specific it's not going to sell right. if you have a book you know look on the amazon they can look at the first 10% of your story, right? It's got all kinds of typos in it. People are just going to go, oh, this is self-published garbage. I'm not going to buy it. But I do want to address that we haven't it. really given an answer as to how much it actually costs. We, we've talked about what, what things you have to maybe consider buying. But, you yeah. know, should we, can we throw out an, an estimate? Of how much it, it oh, costs? Oh, I did. I, I said, yeah, you know, on average, it'll cost you a couple thousand dollars. I thought you said that was just for the cover. No, 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 the covers. Oh, for everything? That's that's generally the editor is most of that cost. Okay. Well, yeah. what you decide with cover and copy editing for a something the length of a novel. And don't forget marketing. Oh, marketing, yes. Yeah, marketing generally is a whole different that. variable because it can be tiny, it can be huge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it could be effective or it could do nothing. Right. So yeah. That's a whole different question. Uh, exactly. We have done episodes on marketing. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a, I mean, if I were to give my estimate answer, I would actually say maybe a little bit more than 2,000, maybe closer to 3,500. No, possibly. That's, that's just yeah. not my estimate. Good editor. Just so folks and know that it's, if you really are serious about it, um, um, expect to, you know, take some money out of pocket. Um, Although, Marty, uh, I'd like to put an asterisk on that one. Audiobook. We did an episode on audiobook, but uh, adding an audiobook to the, the register, how, how much about would that cost? Well, audiobooks, um, depending on how long your novel is, um, uh, on average, um, per finished hour, 
uh, go from about fifty dollars to thousands of dollars. Um, so for a ten-hour-long novel, um, that would be five hundred dollars on the low end, and a couple thousand dollars on uh, um, the higher end. I mean, you can, mm -hmm. you know, can cost you as much as ten thousand dollars, depending on the talent you get for your mm -hmm. narration. Mm -hmm. um, once again, audiobooks is a, another ginormous um, separate topic of their own show. Which we have done. But thank you for the person who asked this question. We hope that it answered yeah. it for you. <laughs> well, I just want to add, Barter is your friend. Barter, yeah, I agree. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what, what they mean by that is you can uh, have cooperative uh, um, relationships with other people that um, do editing and covers and um, all kinds of uh, required items for authors. Yeah. Now, another question we got was, how hard is it to uh, get that first book published? So I'll, I'll answer that one. Um, it wasn't hard. It wasn't particularly hard to format it. Um, formatting it can be as simple as uh, getting a template from, say, Amazon um, and, and pouring your book into it and trying to make it look as much like your vision of a book as possible. Um, it was a little bit harder, a little bit more daunting to actually press the button and go, it's going to be live after I press this button. Uh, and that's just, I, I think, you know, am I ready? And, you know, is this going to sell? Have I done a good job? It's those kind of worries. So that was harder for me to, than anything else uh, was to press that final button. Uh, and then I, I, I find out in the long run that, uh, you know, I did not publish with a good cover. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't sell particularly well. Uh, mm -hmm. And I learned a lot more about formatting books later on. Mm -hmm. uh, my book wasn't badly formatted, but uh, I, I have definitely upped my game since then as well. Right. As hard as it is to publish a book, it's way harder to write it in the first place. Yes. That's the stumbling block for most people. That is. They never get a first draft done. A much lot of less people. a polished final draft, which yeah. is what's required um, mm -hmm. before you even uh, consider publishing. Or so how hard was it? Um, once you put all the work in for getting a final draft, it I don't consider it all that hard. Mm. I mean, a lot of authors, a lot of first-time authors, will like that first chapter, I want to make it better and better. Yes, it's an important hook. But do not spend all your time making the best first chapter that has ever been just to have the rest of the book. Suck. So I have a little bit of a different answer from this coming from a traditional point of view. And I would say it's astronomically hard to get your first book published if you're going with a traditional publisher. And that's your only option uh, in your mm -hmm. perspective. Because, you know, getting an agent, uh, you have to send out dozens of queries, you'll get rejected. Even, even once you get an agent, you could be rejected by publishers. So that is just, yes, that is a very, very hard thing to do. Um, as far as if you are interested in publishing through other means, I think it's only as hard as your biggest weakness. You know, if your biggest weakness is technology, um, you know, navigating the system, navigating um, the tools you need, formatting the book, all that, then that's going to be hard for you. If your biggest weakness is procrastination, then that's going to be your, your, your biggest hurdle. So I do think it's very individual, but um, it, it's a very different story when you're talking traditional versus non-traditional. Fair enough. Thank you. Dave, pick another question. Yeah. Thanks for the question. <laughs> sure. Um, how do you know it's truly done, your story? This is one of my friends. Um, yeah. My... My tool for that basically is, is this. I think that you learn more from completing a story and then working on another story. Uh, I, I don't think you learn as much as you could as a writer just by continually trying to polish the same story again and again and again. I think yeah. other stories after that uh, and, and exercise more of those writer, writing muscles. So my rule of thumb for finishing for when a story is done is when I think it's as good as I can make it and any changes that I contemplated uh, making to it are only making it like half a percent better or maybe it's even just like uh, um, 
arrange, rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. It's just, I'm not, I might be moving things around, but I'm just not making it better. And it's time to leave the story. Yeah. I think another way you can tell um, is when, you know, after you've written the end and you have been working on it. In fact, this person who asked this question said specifically that they would just never stop working on it. And that's why they were wondering, how do you know when it's done? Um, you know, once you have already seen the story through to the end, uh, and maybe you're stuck in the, you know, with David was trying, trying to change things around and make it better. Um, when you get just captured by the idea for a new story, that's, I think, mm. how you know when it's done. That, that's me anyway. You know, when that's I'm, I finish a story and I'm still working on it, oh, I want to make it better. But then another idea has just stolen my heart. And I think that's when I know um, that it's done and okay. I'm ready to move on to my next journey. And I, I put a caveat on that since you were very young. I think for a lot yeah. of people, their first story is something they just can't figure out how to let go of, of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think sometimes you just have to consciously decide that I am not making the story better. It's time to leave. Yeah. I mean, here's yeah, I, I always consider it a really common form of self-sabotage for writers that they uh, um, just can't make themselves better better stop better. the uh, revisions. It doesn't help that every time they go through it, they find more typos. Um, but uh, it's, you know, for me, it's like when snow falls off a leaf, it just goes. You, there's yeah. no explaining what makes it happen mm -hmm. at the time. But I've gone through my process, you know, including, you know, my best draft and then beta readers and then final draft and all that. It's a machine now that forces me to cut it off at the end. Right. And um, as part of that process, I've already outlined the next novel that I'm going to start working on. And um, that makes me want to work on the next novel. So Shay's right. point's very well taken. Right. And I mean, the thing is, you know, you, you, will, you should uh, remember that uh, your novel uh, is not infinite time. Uh, what I wanted to say, though, is this. When you write the end, believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. When you write the end, though, it's not done. You've got to go through and, and look at it and figure out some things and stitch it all together. Just make sure that you've gone through it. But do not think that it's not good enough. Try and get it done. Do some revisions. The first draft is not the final revision but the thousandth draft is too much. Believe in yourself. Cool. What, who's got the next question? Okay. Thanks for the question, whoever asked. That is you. Oh, you want me to read one of mine? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Pick, pick right. a question to ask, any question. All right, let's see. How do you decide what to write? I kind of like that question because there's just so much stuff out there. Um, and I'm interpreting that maybe this questioner was saying, you know, when you have so many ideas, how do you pick one to begin with? Um, or maybe when you have no ideas, how do you pick one to begin with? So how do you decide what to write? I'll go first. For me, it always starts with inspiration. I have lots of inspiration uh, sources. I talk about them all the time, music, movies, you know, other books, you know, uh, photographs, artwork. There's a lot of, it always starts with inspiration for me. And then probably some character development and then the plot line uh, starts to organically grow. And um, I have got more ideas than I'll have time to write by the time I'm dead. So mm -hmm. I uh, uh, will never suffer from write as black. Awesome. For me, it's characters characters are the little people in my head and they tell me what they want and I say well you can't have that and this is why and those inspire me just the little characters and tell me what they want so for me it comes from a, a bunch of different possibilities sometimes it could be a character sometimes it could be a basic story premise um, sometimes it could be just a scene that I have in my in my mind uh, that I need to wrap a story around it in order to get to that scene um, I do find that most of my stories come from the juxtaposition of multiple ideas. Um, 
So when I have ideas, I tend to write them down and, and look at them periodically and see kind of what, uh, what resonates together. Um, and then I, I start, there's a whole pre-writing phase where I start thinking about this premise and it's like, well, what, what would happen in this premise? And, you know, well, who, who would be trying to do this, whatever? Um, and I start fleshing out this story in, in my head. Um, and if I get interested in it, in it enough, I'll write that information down um, and maybe even start outlining a story and, and playing with the ideas and, and accessorizing on it uh, until it becomes interesting enough to me uh, that I actually start writing it. And so I probably have 20, 30 stories in that form um, right now. And I can decide what I want to write next. Okay, I'll do the next question. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything different you do publishing that first book, knowing what you know now? Mm, good question. Um, it is a really great question. And um, there is uh, um, a lot of great answers. I, I would hire a um, cover designer instead of doing it myself. Mm -hmm. um, I would also uh, make sure that it was uh, a lot better proofread uh, than it was. Um, uh, other than that, um, I think that I got pretty lucky and uh, it went really well for the first one out of the blocks. That's nice. David, I think you had some story, uh, story about uh, your first book. Better cover. Yeah. Turns out that I tested some covers with the uh, people in my writing group who had, who had read the story. Mm -hmm. uh, and the cover that I chose resonated really, really, really well with mm -hmm. people who had read the story. Mm -hmm. uh, if you hadn't read the story though, it didn't resonate that much. And it was largely gray, which meant it didn't work very well as a, as a thumbnail on Amazon, which means the thumbnail wasn't interesting, interesting so people didn't click on it. Um, and that kind of puts a kibosh on your sales right there. Uh, so I actually republished it uh, um, last year, mm -hmm. a brand new cover, and it's uh, selling a lot better now. A new title yeah, as a well. New title. Yeah, a new title as well. I'm having a hard time thinking of what I would do differently um, because my first was traditional. And so a lot of those things were not uh, my calls anyway. Um, yeah. You know, well, there, I definitely had a long journey where it was, you know, there was certainly some tears and certainly some throwing stuff in trash cans and, you know, saying mm -hmm. never again, that kind of thing. Oh. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking, well, would I have wanted to be more optimistic and and eternally positive during that journey? I don't mm -hmm. know, maybe maybe not. You know, the, the pain of that is also sort of a rite of passage for some authors. Well, so I, I don't think I would change that. And then as far as the actual process of publishing the book, um, you know, there were some, some, losses you know some things i disagreed with that i didn't want the publisher to do or to change that they yeah. ended up doing anyway yeah. or needing to do anyway and i, I as someone who is uh, notorious for combat rage speaking of our last uh, episode talking about fight scenes uh someone who has quite combat quite the combat rage uh as a person also uh i think i dealt pretty well with uh with those losses uh, you know, I definitely threw in the towel when it was time to throw in the towel and respectfully said, all right, you know, thanks, thanks for um, all you do and I'll go with it, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, I do encourage people to just be flexible, yeah. stay optimistic, yeah. um, keep flexible, fighting if it's what advice. you want. But I mean, let me ask you, Shay, I mean, first sure. of all, that bonfire story of all your rejection letters, yeah. I love that story. Yeah. But um, let me ask you this. Given that you were forced to change things, would you have been happy or self-publishing? Oh, that's a good question. Um, personally, no, because personally, it was a dream. It was always my dream, mm -hmm. um, traditional publication or bust. And I, I think in another episode previously, I mentioned that might, that might be the case because I started writing very young and my idols were all traditionally published. And you know, to me, that's what success looked like. Success looked like traditional publication. So, um, no, I would not have um, traded that control for, uh, or traded that, um, whatever, trade, trade the traditional publication deal for control. 
Um, I'm okay with the sacrifices I made, but I acknowledge and I'm excited that the uh, landscape is definitely changing. And I think people who are joining us right now and just starting their first books um, have different options of what success looks like. For them, maybe it's still traditional publication, um, or maybe that would just be kind of fun and kind of great, but you know, not as great as keeping control and doing everything that you want to do. So there's definitely a changing landscape right now. That is, that is a great story, Rachel. Yeah, thanks. Now, I'm going to ask. Uh, Go for it. Folks, as you may know, I run a writing group on Mondays, and I run a writing group on Saturdays. So one of our viewers did ask, how do you find a writer's group? And I always think that this is an interesting question because of this trials and tribulations that I did through some of my writing group. My, my Monday writing group pretty much exploded it, or rather imploded, uh, whatever the metaphor would be, is that everyone left. And I had to start it again from scratch. And that happened. It's, writer's group is all about vibe. You're going to find folks that have the right vibe, that are just want to be there, that get along, they gel, they understand, they know that the, the, the constructive criticism isn't a tear on them. It's something to help them and that we all believe in each other. Those are the right. And that's what we have on Sundays. The hourlings, it's a great bunch of folks. Yeah, building one from scratch is um, always an option. Yeah, um, which I just described. There's lots of ways that you can actually find a writer's group. I actually found um, this writer's group um, through meetup.com, which is mm -hmm. a website that um, is designed specifically for finding groups like that yeah. or activity groups to go biking or canoeing or camping mm -hmm. or, or watch a, a bazillion ever bazillion other science books. Um, but it, if you go in there and take a search for your area, uh, pretty much everywhere, you will find something. Um, also, the other place that uh, I have found to be useful is go to your local library, and they usually have a bulletin board. Oh, and yeah. The bulletin board will typically have, you know, a, uh, a schedule or uh, an advertisement for a writer's group. Yeah, it often will. Although, I mean, obviously, your mileage may vary. Obviously, we're all hoping that everyone gets vaccinated from the virus by this time. Well, also, I think uh, we've alluded to this already. Um, writer, writers groups have different, uh, for want of a better word, I'll say personalities. Um, and so you may uh, look around to find a writers group that matches your needs. Uh, my first writing group was, uh, I think, a pretty good writing group. It was the uh, Saturday group uh, that uh, Jeffrey runs. Um, but it was more of a literary group uh, rather than a science fiction group. Mm -hmm. uh, I had also covered poetry, uh, which uh, at the time, yeah, you don't have much poetry now. But. Uh, it's just not my forte. Um, mm -hmm. so when a when a science fiction and fantasy oriented writing group split off from that, um, yeah, that, solid group. I went with that, and it uh, it has turned out to be very well, uh, very well run, very effective, and we have a hell of a lot of people uh, now in that group who have published books. Mm -hmm. Some are actually doing pretty well. Yeah, the another important point for that, finding a genre-specific writers group is important because um, you had alluded to the fact that, okay, if you join a writers group and most of them are doing poetry and poetry is not your thing, if you submit your science fiction story there, it's probably not their thing. And the yeah. feedback you get from them usually may not be as good as it otherwise would for a genre-specific writer's group. Yeah, it was definitely an interesting mix. And keep in mind also that writer's groups evolve. So that writer's group that you thought was perfect for you from the beginning, maybe after five years, it's not for you anymore. Feel free to walk away and try something else. Mm -hmm. Try a different group. Using Hourlings as an example, I would say that Hourlings is a writing group that started out as a beginning writing group and is oh, yeah. an intermediate to professional writers group. Yeah. Uh, rising tide lifts all boats. Exactly. Dave, you're you're up next. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to steal another question. Um, how do you do world building? Aha. We love those questions because that's a great topic for episodes 
yeah, many an yeah, episode. That's a topic. So, and everybody does it differently, and there's no right or wrong way. Now, my particular way is I try to sketch out my background. So I, I believe in something that I call uh, just-in-time uh, world building. So in order to do that, what I try to do is I try to sketch out uh, kind of the shape of things. I don't need to know how every aspect of my world works. I just need to have a broad outline for how things work. And then if my story ventures into a particular area, then I have to flesh out that area in more detail. So I have to have some idea of how the pieces fit together. But uh, if there's an evil church in the world, I need to know that it's there, but I don't have to flesh it out unless my character is going to be interacting with it. Um, so that, that concept of just in time uh, world building, but you've sketched it out, um, I think is, is very powerful and it, it helps eliminate the um, where people get bogged down in world building to the point where they, they never seem to be com complete enough to actually start the novel. I'm talking about you, Mr. Tolkien. I'll echo what Dave said. Uh, and another power of uh, doing just in time world building is that uh, you can add stuff later. Yeah. If you don't completely, you know, set the fidelity of your world, you know, in your first chapter, um, you have flexibility later on and you can add things later that not, you may. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I will say this. I mean, you can do this in passes. You may finish that first breath, get it all the way to the, the end. And then you can go back and add, flesh out more details. World building doesn't have to be the first time you run through. It can be through passes and through uh, filling out uh, gaps. That yeah, ideas in. happen that will yeah. help increase the fidelity on your world building. But mm -hmm. world building done right makes stories really awesome. I love that. And for me, I tend to write multiple stories. After investing that much effort in world building, I tend to write multiple stories in the world. Yeah. I do as well. 10,000 worlds. Yeah, yeah. I, I love your 10,000 kingdom. Directions. And that's pretty powerful too. Um, rather than having to do it all at once, it, it's sort of the accretion of details from a bunch of stories. Mm -hmm. Your mileage may vary, but it's a powerful technique. Mm -hmm. Now, Shay, you may think that your novel hasn't done much world building, but that's not really true. Mm -hmm. You know, it just yeah. uses the foundation of real world as a starting point, but... <laughs> World building includes, you know, everything associated school. with the setting. You so your characters, you know, Absolutely. what are they wearing? We're running out of questions. <laughs> okay, okay, who's up next? I think that's you, Shay. I know. I'm trying to think of what um, that is one we haven't done yet. Let's see. I think the last one that I can see is what strategies do you use to get past writer's block? The notorious writer's block. Writer's block. Ah, I don't believe in it. Uh, yeah. yeah, me neither. No, I, I, mean, I have exactly the opposite from writer's block, whatever that is. Writer's I mean, gush. From for me, it's it's never a question of block. Sometimes it's just I'm thinking about this scene. I want to research it more. I don't consider that a block. I consider that just me informing myself better to how to write this scene but I'm still benefiting from it because I know the scene's going to be better having done that research, but that's not a block. That's just me wanting to write a better scene. Not a block if it's what I'd call a, a temporary. Um, pause. Yeah. Pause. Yeah. yeah. Uh, even I stop to research things. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, that's one of the joys of being a writer is I get to learn exactly. stuff. Exactly. Yeah. For, for useful reasons. I mean, now you can ask me all about the bat Batalava attacks in Paris. But I know reason, way too much about that. The reason I don't really believe in writer's block is um, I have far too many ideas. Uh, like Marty, I will never live long enough to, to write down, to write stories about all the ideas that I have. So if it's an idea issue, I don't have a problem with that. And if oh, it's and don't. a writing issue, well, I've been trained for years at work that... Uh, you know, if I need to write a document, uh, granted not science fiction, but if I need to write a document, you sit down and you write it. Yeah. And so even if you're not really in the mood, if you sit down, <laughs> you may have to throw away a few paragraphs, but pretty soon your writer, your writer instincts will kick in, I think. Yeah. 
And I mean, I, I have stories up the wazoo in terms of Project Chronosphere. That, that universe, oh my goodness. I will never live long enough to tell you all the stories in that universe. As far as I'm concerned, if you treat writing like a job, yeah, you know, you never have job block. Mm -hmm. You never have trouble getting out of bed to go to work. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so it's the same discipline associated with that. If you have discipline, you just sit down whether you feel like it or not. You don't wait for the muse. You just do the thing. And um, if you just sit down and you write, whether you feel like it or not. You know, you'll never have writer's block. Now, mm -hmm. I, I have more opinions about that. I think that outlining the hell out of stuff is proof against writer's block because you always know the next thing you need to write. Yeah, you always have some place you're going. Even if you don't necessarily go there, having the outline to say you at least know you can go there, even if you don't go there, helps. Yeah, just writing one sentence a day works for me, and I have writer's block. Um, yeah. And the the uh, the real culprit of writer's block for me is the longer period of time I put between working on the book and not working on it. Because mm. if I leave a book for months, you know, weeks to months, I lose my my thread of where I was heading with it. Yeah. Um, and that's that's what happens to me with writer's block. So I think consistency is the, is the yeah. best key to writer's block, even if you don't think or, or if it doesn't look like you're making much progress make a plan seven to nine every day i'm writing no matter what make a habit of it it doesn't matter if it's time or if it's word count or mm -hmm. but let's, yeah. let's just keep busting it out yeah i see here the actual last question on the list that Are we have one? here is uh what tools do you like to use as a writer ah. And uh, uh, yeah. we, we've had episodes about that, too. But I'll, I'll just tell mine real quick. I like Scrivener, which mm -hmm. is uh, an authoring tool. Um, I like using Microsoft Word, Post Scrivener. Word and um, uh, because it's a standard that all your editors want to use and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I also like using Grammarly, which is a plugin for Microsoft handy. Word. And Pro Writing Aid. Pro Writing Aid. Um, there's other tools... Um, you know, like GIMP and other specialty tools for specific for, yeah. things. And Vellum. I'll, I'll call it there. If you're if you're yeah. a beginning writer and you want to get started and you don't want to have to worry about the tool, get Scrivener. Yeah. It's cheap. Oh, Scrivener, it's definitely. 39 it's bucks. Cheap. It's, it's cheap. Yeah. And even PC's got 3.0 now. It's nice. Does it really? Yeah. PCs are now got to see if it mine updated. Yeah. No, well, it's not a free update. You got to buy it. But uh, ah. unless you did, well, unless you bought Scrivener during their grace period of like auto upgrading. I'll have to check. Yeah, but it's only $50. I mean, it's not like you got to sweat it. So what about you, Dave? Shay, got any tools you like that I didn't mention? I am this very old school, I guess. I use Word mm -hmm. and I guess occasionally scribble on a pad, a notepad or a journal uh, for ideas. <laughs> Uh, you, like you told me about a tool called Hemingway Editor. Oh, yeah. Which uh, I, I actually enjoy that tool. Oh, good. I'm glad. Yeah, actually, you're right. So there's some software tools, I guess, yeah, like Hemingway, mm -hmm. which uh, helps you make your sentences smaller and tells you when you're going nuts with run-on sentences and all that. Uh, so, yeah, I do like that. I do like that. Yeah. I don't know. The, the big one for me was Scrivener. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Scrivener is it helps. an integrated development environment that shows you Here's your story. Um, here's uh, here's the outline of your story, and you can easily move things around. You can show your story as cards, mm -hmm. uh, index cards. Um, you can store all your research right there within the interface. Yeah, I got this really big monitor. I have my text here and my outline over there, and I can just keep referring to my outline as I'm writing my my text. It's it's similar to tools that I use for software development. So when I found out that something like Scrivener was available for writing. Yeah. Oh, it, and it was developed by developers, actual software engineers developed Scrivener. So yeah, you can tell. I bought it. Was it's, a, uh, it's a great tool. Highly recommend it to anybody that uh, wants to start authoring. It'll make it everything easier. In fact, I I'll credit it with being one of the things that really enabled me to actually get my first novel out. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, one last thing, though, I will say to the person that wanted to know if we're happy. Yes, we're happy. And uh, you solve it with a flood. Oh, yeah. And I want to end on my favorite question, which was a friend of mine that posed to us that asking all writers, what do you want to ask writers? And his question was, how dare you? Just how dare you? Just, and that's <laughs> my favorite dare. question. And we're so dare I? How dare us write a book? It's not a it's not a matter of me getting permission to write a book. Yeah, you just got to stop me. <laughs> yeah, try that's and how I dare. Mm -hmm. That's it. We're coming for you, and we're gonna have a book. <laughs> I, I thought about being a writer for so many years, and then when I finally started doing it and realized how much fun I was having um, and how much fun other people were having reading my stories. Um, and it, it also gives me the opportunity to, to do the kind of research that I love and then fit it into a story and show off my world building skills and stuff. It's, I, I can't really imagine at this point, not writing. Yep. It's great stuff. That's how we dare. That's All right, guys, another great episode. Thank we'll you. Friendly structured. Next week. Friendly structured.